Art is open to interpretation, but here's something that's totally clear. You can save on your bus trip to the First Street Transit Gallery to see works from CSULB students. Get your Go Beach Pass from Long Beach Transit for as little as $40 a month for unlimited bus rides. Then go check out pieces from your fellow students on display in downtown Long Beach. Great value and great art. It's as easy to understand as that. For more information on the Go Beach Pass from Long Beach Transit, visit ridelbt.com forward slash students. As like queer Latinx people, you know, it's hard to, to want to identify with something that people refuse to believe in, that actively refuse to believe in. And I see so many like straight Latinx people constantly posting about this kind of stuff or whenever the conversation comes up, we'll post it on their stories. And it's just like, when are they gonna realize that they're standing on the complete opposite side of change? Welcome back to Beach Weekly, a podcast created and produced by Long Beach State student-run newspaper, The Daily 49er. My name is Jeremy Taylor, the podcast editor here at The Daily 49er. And joining us as always is the multi-talented Cindy Aguilera. Cindy, how's it going? Hi, what's up, everybody? It's going great. We have some great stories to talk about tonight, and um, let's get started. I don't know if you're familiar with track and field, but in track and field, especially in track, there's, you know, the four by 100 relay, which is one of the fun races. And in the relay, you have to have an anchor. That's your, like your most important runner in your race. And anchoring us this week is going to be our special projects coordinator, Lillian Lee. Lily, thank you for joining us today. Tell everybody about yourself. Hey, what's up? So as I said before, I'm the special projects coordinator. Um, I'm working really hard to get some issues out for you guys. I handle all the physical prints. So our newest one is coming out next week. Um, Hope you guys go and check it out. So you've been super busy this week. I know we've been exchanging messages on Slack and everything. Tell us about how this week has been going for you. Oh, this week has been very, very busy. Uh, Right now, we're actually hard at work editing some stuff and getting it all in for our graphic design editor. So we're kind of cobbling everything together today. So it's been kind of hectic, but very looking forward to it being over with and we can, you know, enjoy the finished product. And how long has this uh, whole project been in development? It's been a few weeks. We started like in mid So this has definitely been a long time coming. It's and, you know, the turnaround is pretty fast, all things considered, but very much excited for what's going to turn out. And what's been the biggest challenge about doing this special issue? Um, I mean, the challenges definitely are consistent across many of the special issues that we've already done. I mean, there's the idea making, which falls on me and some of our editors and stuff like that. Um, And then just kind of getting everything together, especially because there's not much done to prepare until the stories are brought in. So that's just kind of, you know, communicating with the writers and finding and get every, getting everything done. All right. Well, that sounds great. I mean, you, we appreciate the hard work that you've been doing here and, you know, taking the time to sit out and chop it up with us. It, we appreciate it. So let's get to the reason why everybody's here and let's get everybody up to speed with the Beach Weekly Update. All right. Let's get to the reason why everybody is here. We're going to hit everybody with the news. First up is Cindy. Cindy, what you got for us? Hi, everyone. So um, as you know, that October is LGBTQ History Month, and uh, the Daily 49er is just releasing a series of stories all focused around LGBTQ um, and really highlighting the different facets of being part of the community. Um, One really, really good story coming up is by reporter Kelsey Brown, where um, she talks with Professor Gabriel Estrada, who explains the history of two-spirit in the indigenous culture and how colonialism has impacted it. Uh, Many indigenous cultures did not have genders or were binary at all until European Western ideas were forced on them. Um, So it sounds super informative and it's very timely because again, we are celebrating LGBTQ plus history month um, in October. And um, as well, uh, we have a second story um, here and this is uh, to prepare us for National Stress Awareness Month in November. Um, Jonathan Begall, Daily 49 reporter, shares that Cal State Long Beach has a new crisis hotline called Beach Crisis Text Line, um, and that this hotline provides support and crisis intervention for CSULB students 
staff, and their families. And this hotline is meant to help resolve personal, family, or work-related problems. You can access um, this hotline and talk to a counselor by texting BEACH to 741-741. You know what, I think that's a really good idea. I know that college can be stressful, and then especially for kids who are, you know, their first time away from home, just everything that you know, encompasses adulthood. So for them to be able to have that kind of outreach for our students and our fellow students is pretty tremendous. Monday is Indigenous Peoples Day. So it's very timely that, you know, they're running that story. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of like why these sort of issues are so important to be released because like everybody gets a chance to learn, you know, that's something that we didn't know. I didn't know that. And it makes a lot of sense. I think like it, it, I, I'm personally really excited to, to read it when it finally does get published and, and we can learn more about this two spirit because um, it sounds very interesting. It and is yeah, very like, interesting. Yeah, this, this hotline, so not to interrupt, but like a little bit in the article, it says how sometimes students just want to vent and it's not like they want, you know, that like super in-depth counseling. Sometimes they just want, to like literally just vent to somebody very immediate access to a counselor is like you said it's so helpful for those moments where sometimes as college students we have like very stressful moments and we just want to vent well you think about it too like when you talk to your friends there's only so much you really want to tell your friends because it's like there's a certain things you want to keep private so it's good for them to have that kind of outlet i'm going to go on and hit you with some news stories right now Protesters call for reproductive justice at the Women's March in downtown Long Beach. In a story written by Hannah Shields, over a thousand protesters gathered this past weekend to rally against the new Texas abortion law that was passed in early September. Women of all ages, men, families, and couples were seen marching, holding signs, and singing as they walked down the streets of Long Beach. Texas has really been under fire with a lot. You know, they've got their voter restriction laws. And now they passed this abortion law that has been anything extremely controversial, having their voices be heard and letting them know that this is not OK. The only thing that I can hope is that those who are in power are able to listen to the people and we can go in and make this change, because unfortunately, the law, I believe, was blocked by the Supreme Court. Oh, no, they tried to the Supreme Court tried to block the law, but I guess Texas overrode it. So we'll see how that story develops in sports. Thomas Murray wrote a feature article on Jenna Giambi. Jenna is the niece of Jason Giambi, a former Cal State Long Beach alumni member. And Jason is also uh, a 19-year MLB player. Jason hit 440 home runs during his MLB career, but Jenna is looking to carve out her own legacy. The communications major is in her first year of playing volleyball at the beach with dreams of becoming an All-American and a career in sports broadcasting. So Jenna, we look forward to watching you develop and perform on the court and good luck to you in your future. Lillian, last but definitely not least, what do you have for us? Yeah, so actually speaking of sports, we have a story coming up by Matthew Brown, who is actually one of our own uh, sports interns on the editorial board. Um, it's called Rise in LGBTQ Plus Athletes Proves Sports Culture is Changing for the Better. Um, he basically outlines, you know, the history of athletes coming out in particularly America and how the world has reacted to it and, you know, how things have built up to LGBTQ plus athletes in the professional sports world today. It's a really, really interesting read. I really enjoyed reading it. So I hope you guys will enjoy it too. Um, it definitely addresses the Tokyo Olympics as well, which had a tremendous, you know, um, outreach as far as LGBTQ plus um, athletes go. And there was, you know, some controversies regarding that, but overall the representation was great. Um, and then another thing that's coming out in the new October issue is a uh, queer artist to add to your October playlist by Timothy Wu, which is actually already up on the uh, website. So if you guys want to check that out and get a little sneak peek on what's coming up in the um, special issue, feel free to. Um, Timothy essentially outlines um, a little bit of history of LGBTQ plus pop and stuff like that, um, kind of addressing some controversies, some less well-received um, uh, music that kind of maybe exploits ideas of LGBTQ, you know, culture. And then 
gives some personal recommendations, five of his favorite artists, including Holland, um, Haley Kyoko, Fletcher, all that sort of thing. So I would totally recommend giving this a try and please give all of these artists a listen. They're really, really good. I would highly recommend them. I've listened to all of them. Um, and yeah, I really hope that you guys come check out the uh, special issue, which you can find around campus. On that list, who's your favorite artist? Oh, it's gotta be Haley Kyoko. All right, <laughs> tell, me Kyoko. About it. tell me about yeah. this person. Oh my gosh. I can tell you, I could talk all day about Haley Kyoko. She was actually the artist that kind of clued me in on my own sexuality. I identify as lesbian. Um, and I remember watching her girls like girls music video for the first time in like sixth grade. And I was like, that is an option. Um, she's a huge advocate for LGBT rights as, um, Timothy has written. Um, she's an actress turned, um, artist and LGBTQ advocate. Um, and her music, as Timothy says, is focused around helping her fans find themselves and come to terms with their identity and sings about the potential struggles and depression that others may face based on her experiences. So I highly recommend her. She's definitely my favorite on that list. What's your favorite song by her? Oh my gosh. I don't know if I can pick. I really, really, really like Girls Like Girls. I also like Sleepover. Sleepover is really good. Her whole um, debut album, Expectations, is just, it just blew me away. It was really good. Have you ever been able to see her in concert? I really, really wanted to, but I wasn't able to. The best I could do was pre-order her album and get a shirt. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> Number one, you said that you, you know, when you were in sixth grade, that's when you first heard her. Is that correct? Yeah. What a confusing time going through puberty and then trying to discover your identity. It's dope that she was able to give you like, you know, like a beacon of light to kind of guide you through that journey or whatever, you know, at such a young age when let's be honest, during that prepubescent age, we barely know where up is and where down is and left and right. So that's, a, that's really <laughs> awesome that she was able to help you out through that. I believe little Nas X was on there as well. I don't, I think that he, yeah, he was definitely brought up. He was not on the list, but he was brought up. <laughs> Are any of you a fan of Little Nas X? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, that song, Old Town Country Road, I know it's old and that's his first single, but I don't know how many times my eight-year-old has made me sing that song in the car. <laughs> oh, it's a so catchy cute. song. It's a catchy it's song. It's super catchy. And I always have to be Billy Ray Cyrus. You know what <laughs> I mean? So <laughs> I don't know the rest of his catalog, but doggone it, I know that uh, Old Town Country Road. So... <laughs> Damn, he's just been blowing up. He's been doing commercials, Elton John. He's got his shoes going, coming out. My man, not Lil Nas X, is out there doing big things. So much success to him. Is that all the news we have for this week, Cindy? Well, actually, since we are talking about the October issue that's coming up, I'm writing a story where I interview Johnny Sweet. He is a 24-year-old queer uh, man from Los Angeles, and he shares how he grew up Catholic, you know, how conservative his family was um, when he came out and just how much they've grown throughout the years as they've seen him sort of like, what is the word that I'm trying to think of? Like he's turned into who he's always wanted to be, you know, being non-binary sometimes is hard to understand for family members. So it's a very interesting story. It was an awesome interview and I can't wait for everyone to be able to read that. What a way to bury the lead there. Come on, you got to come up and hit, hit us with your first, your story first. Come on now. I, I mean, you know, I was, I was waiting because I, I wanted to, to save that one for last. Um, no, but it was, it's a great story because it's so relatable. You know, he, his parents are Mexican. They grew up in a really small town and they have a very limited, like, point of view of just what LGBTQ, first of all, is you know, they had to learn how to accept him not being like the typical, quote unquote, you know, gay person that they sort of expected, I guess. And it's it's interesting because, you know, like I said, it's relatable. Um, so many people in our culture go through this and like not every family, you know, is able to adjust. So what led you to the story? I have known him for quite some time and I admired him and I just, you know, because we're highlighting uh, LGBTQ stories and voices this month, I wanted, to, I just thought about like the people that I admire and I look up to. And so I asked him and of course he was available for an interview, thankfully, and, and we got to sit down and talk. Well, coming from 
I was baptized Catholic many, many moons ago, and I know how strict and regimented the Catholic faith is. I can't imagine what it was like growing up with the confusion or the emotions that he might have been feeling at the time. I really look forward to reading that story and hearing his tale. So I think that is about it all this week. Lillian, do you have anything else you would like to plug? Um, yeah, just check out the October issue. Keep an eye out for all of our other issues. They're, they come out pretty much every month. You know, they're put up in all those little boxes that you see. You got the 49er, you got 22 West. So when you see something there, just grab one, take a look at it. We really appreciate it. Everybody has been working very hard on this issue as well as other issues. We have a great talented team. Um, Lillian is just one of many cogs in the wheel that keeps the ship going. So thank you for taking your time to sit in with us and, you know, school us up on what's going on with this issue. That is all we have for this week. Head on over to daily49er.com where you can read more campus and Long Beach related news, as well as multimedia content like this podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Daily49er. Hey, if you are not following us on Twitter, and if you are not following us on Instagram, stop what you're doing right now. Pull out your phone, your mobile device, your laptop. Give us a like. Give us a follow on and keep up to date with what we're doing. Thank you so much, as always, for Cindy Aguilera, for Lillian Lee. My name is Jeremy Taylor. Be good people, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye, y'all. Bye. Thank you. Hello, thank you for joining me on this week's episode of Beach Weekly. I am your host, Aziza Gomez, and today's episode is about Hispanic Heritage Month. Hispanic Heritage Month started September 15 and goes until October 15. For those of you thinking it's random to celebrate it in the middle of the month, the reason is the 15th of September is when we gained independence from Spain for many countries such as El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. Mexico actually declared its independence from Spain on September 16th. October 12th is Dia de la Raza, or the Day of the Race. It's the day that Christopher Columbus landed in the Caribbean. A few Latin American countries celebrate it as the day that the Hispanicization of the Americas began. Joining me today are my friends Joey Naz and Sergio Allen. Grab your cafecito and pan and enjoy. Hey guys, welcome to the show. How's your day going so far? It's going good. It's going good. It's going very well. Period. Well, I know you guys and I'm obsessed with both of you, but for our listeners, would you mind introducing yourselves and telling us what terms you use and prefer? Yeah, okay. I'll go, I'll go first. Um, I'm Sergio Lan Diaz. Um, I'm a first-gen recent college graduate. I graduated from Cal State Fullerton with a degree in Chicano and Chicano Studies and a minor in Cell Biology. Um, I prefer to use the term Latinx and identify with the pronouns he, they. And hi, everybody. I'm Joey Naz, and my pronouns are they, them. And I am a alumni of Cal State Long Beach, and I got my degree in jazz studies with a focus in performance. And yeah, I'm ready to talk with y'all. Oh, my God. I've been excited all day. So how does it feel to be first generation students? And what challenges have you faced? Oh, being a first generation student is it's wild, you know, because there is at least in my family, um, I'm the oldest child. So I like set the standard in a sense because my parents were always putting a lot of like time and resources into me to get into college. Um, so I'm very grateful for my parents and for that. And I'm glad that I'm able to set that type of example for my siblings if they do want to end up going to college. Um, uh, the challenges I face, there were many, there are so many because I come from a low income family that lives in Compton. And so choosing a school all the way in Cal State Fullerton was a big trek because at the time I didn't have a car. My first semester, I had to take the bus. Uh, well, I actually had to take like three buses to get to school. And that was like a total of like three hours, just one way. And so I, I was dedicated to getting to school, you know, like I started off as a biology major. I would wake up probably like four in the morning to catch the bus at five to get to school by eight. So it, it was a struggle at the beginning, but luckily my grandma pulled through and she got me a car in my second semester. So that was really, really nice. But honestly, that was one of the biggest hurdles I had to like go through first was just transportation towards school. 
That's so awesome. You have the best grandma ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I also feel like some of the biggest challenges I faced, especially being like a first generation student coming from a uh, Latinx home, um, you you grow up with a lot of behavior that you have to learn how to change in order to exist, you know, like amongst people in a way that isn't toxic and in a way that like doesn't, you know, harm other people with your beliefs. And I think um, especially being queer and like from such a young age and knowing it and then um, coming into my older self, you know, there was a lot of of behavior that had to be unlearned in the way that we talked about ourselves, the way that we talked about our bodies, you know what I mean? And so um, some of the biggest hurdles were those mental hurdles, you know, being able to believe in yourself as a first gen student, you know, you, you've never had anybody set the example. You are the example that you try to put, you know? And so believing in yourself can be extremely difficult, but you know, you, you overcome, you know? <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I relate to you guys a lot. I'm the only child in my family, and I'm a girl, so when I was sent to college, I had this, like, feeling of stress and guilt because I felt like I was leaving my parents when I came here, but at the same time, they worked so hard to send me to school. Yeah. So, um, I think that it sucks that I'm, like, the only one representing my family, because there's sometimes where I don't perform highly in school and it's okay sometimes, but I feel like because I'm first generation, I really have to be careful about what I'm doing because I have other people that I'm supporting, you know? And speaking of being a girl, um, has there ever been a moment where a person has stereotyped you guys? Mm, I'm assuming they have, you know, being brown and being male and being perceived as like, you know, with masculine features, I'm sure like people have stereotyped me in one way or another. And, you know, once I really became comfortable with my queerness and became more open with that as well, I'm pretty sure people have stereotyped me and like said things in their heads, but like openly and like overtly towards me, I don't. I've never experienced that, um, so yeah. Um, I feel like in, especially because I was in an art department at Cal State Long Beach, there was a huge stereotype around like what kind of difference there is between like a straight art student or like a, a not queer art student and then queer art students. And there was a huge stigma around kind of embracing yourself, at least uh, where I went to school. And so um, I, I was I was extremely, um, I felt extremely cut off from everybody. And for those kinds of stereotypes, maybe this idea that because I'm, you know, a very openly queer and um, like non-binary, there is this always idea surrounding, like I couldn't do what all these like dudes could do. I couldn't, you know, like perform at the capacity that a man could, um, whatever that means. And, you know, those, those feelings, they followed me like through all of college. I always felt so separate from everybody. Um, so yeah, I did feel stereotyped, you know? Yeah, I feel you. I remember back in high school, so I went to a 90% Hispanic high school, our band director, who was a white guy, was like, yeah, when you guys perform, give it your all. You don't want them to think they're right by saying that you can only play the song Tequila. And it was like those microaggressions that like n went over my head. And at the end of the day, he would be like, yeah, I feel like I'm an honorary Mexican because I'm around all of you guys all the time. Back now, I'm like, why would you say that? You know, what, <laughs> what compelled yeah. him to say that, you know? I think, I think I've had a lot of moments like that in music school, especially, is where somebody will tell me something, um, and not to be specific, but like somebody would compare me to some kind of Latin artist just because of like my hair or just because I was, I played a vibraphone and vibraphone is very big in Latin music, you know? Um, so I, there was always moments like that where I'd be like, what compelled you to say that to me? 
what compelled you to like open your mouth and have those words come out? Like, <laughs> I definitely feel that. When they're like, use your hot Latin blood. Yeah, stuff like that. That, and even if they didn't necessarily say it like that, there was, you know, there was always that idea as well. You know, people were always like, "Oh wow, Joseph, you're so fiery behind the vibraphone." <laughs> and, and you know, so, some people don't necessarily know that that exactly what they're saying is like a microaggression or that they're being, you know, like, like, um, you know, that they're doing that. But it. It, they are regardless you know so sometimes people don't even know they're being weird um so what is something you feel like people in our culture should be more aware of um literally just queer existence you know the existence of non-binary people the existence of trans people specifically of color um you know within like latinx communities it you know, we see homophobia, it's so rampant, like on the daily, you know, people get killed for it, people get stereotyped, they get discriminated against, you know, and it's important to be here as a queer individual, as a brown individual, and as a Latinx individual, you know, like, it's, it's this idea that we have to break those stereotypes and just that confinement that, oh, if you're like brown and Latinx, you have to be straight because of you know, machismo, because of the patriarchy, because of, of Catholicism, you know, because of colonization, that internal colonization, that's the stuff that we have to break. And just being a queer individual, you're breaking that, you know, you're breaking all of those like systems, all of those institutions, you know, that have taught us to hate ourselves and that have told us that we have to erase our identities because of these institutions, because of these systems, you know? So I think that's something that people should be aware of. Even if an individual hasn't per se come out, they exist as non-binary, they exist as trans, they exist as queer, you know? So people have to understand that, if, you know, even if it's just someone who might look quote unquote straight passing or stuff like that, that's, you know, they're queer, they can be queer. So that's something that everybody needs to recognize, truly. You said like internalized, like sometimes like we internalize all these things i think that's so true like we we continue to ha like keep these habits within our culture just because maybe we want to like get out of our comfort zone and open up you know? and yeah I don't know if i heard this somewhere but the quote is like self love is your like biggest way to show like radical thinking like the fact that you love yourself regardless of like if you fit or you don't fit in other people's standards, that's something we need to aim for because we love each other. Exactly. And like, I think that's a big thing that we're saying, like stepping out of our comfort zones. You know, there's this huge conversation in the Latinx community about, oh, like we shouldn't be using Latinx or LX or AX or just like anything that has an X because it's not grammatically correct. And it's just like, uh, like one, I don't think that these are the conversations for like straight people to be deciding like what what terms the queer community uses. And like, that's what I see the biggest. It's always people being like, oh, like those snowflakes like wanna change it so it's inclusive. And like, oh, like Latinx isn't a real term because it doesn't make sense grammatically. And all you're, all that they're doing is being homophobic. Like they like people don't understand the weight behind their resistance, and like what they're doing is like further not only like dividing like the community, but also like furthering ourselves down a system that doesn't like uh, that doesn't bend to the people's will, you know. And as as like queer Latinx people, you know it's hard to, to want to identify with something that people refuse to believe in, that actively refuse to believe in. And I see so many like straight Latinx people constantly posting about this kind of stuff or whenever the conversation comes up, we'll post it on their stories. And it's just like, when are they gonna realize that they're standing on the complete opposite side of change, that they're standing on the complete opposite side of revolution, of self-love, of like, like a nationalized effort for people to embrace themselves and like learn from that, you know? Like one day 
one day every like everybody has to start realizing what they're doing and it's just insane that our community can't come together for one thing for queer people like we can't come together for queer people you know and i think that's insane because i have always not only been queer i have always been an advocate for brown and black people and like when it comes to this like second consciousness of having to be queer on top of having to be brown it's like not only do like some straight white people not accept me straight brown people don't accept me and it's just like like you know it's always this it's always this battle you have to do with your identity um when when stuff like that is constantly rejected so i think that's something that needs to be acknowledged and also that there's intent behind the x it's not just there as a placeholder if it's being used as a placeholder latinx is being used wrong because you're not considering the lives of queer people. You're just assuming that, oh, we're gonna change it to make it more inclusive. And when in reality, like per se, when I was studying in Cal State Fullerton, some people wanted to change the, the department to Chicanx, but I was opposed to that because the curriculum was Chicano and Chicano. There was no queer studies. It wasn't until I, like, I graduated that a professor who's queer got hired full time, you know? so. There's intent behind the X. And when people try to dismiss the X, they're not understanding the concept behind it. You know, so we have to be aware that when we use Latinx, that we are including queer people, that we're not just going to be talking about Latinos and Latinas. Yeah. I feel like that's why there's such a pushback, because they don't want to face the fact that there are queer Latinx people that are underrepresented and that we're the reason why they are underrepresented. Also, I want to I want to add another thing to this uh to this platform. <laughs> I want to talk about colorism between the Hispanic community because my both my parents they're both Mexican, they're both born in Mexico, but they're light like they're light skin, you know? And I feel like from a young age I've kind of seen that that privilege that they have, you know, versus like someone who say is a little darker and doesn't have as many opportunities because they're being discriminated against. And another way that I've seen it is growing up with like other Hispanic kids that think they can use the N word because they're not white. And that's like illogical. Like don't say the N word, you're not black, period. But I feel like so many Hispanic people think that just because they're Hispanic, they can get away with certain things. But at the end of the day, I feel like it does come down to skin color because that's what we are being judged for. You know, like mm -hmm. you're white and you're Mexican. Sure, you could be discriminated against, but you need to, you need to really just acknowledge that you have your white privilege. Even mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's something we need to open up about because there's so much discrimination against like dark brown Mexican people, even in Mexico. Even mm -hmm. discriminated by the color of their skin in their own home, like their own home, like. I wasn't it like un until recently that mm. like black people in Mexico finally got onto the census? It so, wasn't, yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't until I believe 2019 that the Mexican census allowed people to identify as black. So realistically, it was as if like no black people existed in Mexico in the eyes of the government until recently. So it's blatant. It's mm -hmm. literally blatant, you it's know? literally systematic. Like, because, you, know? you know, the Spanish came over here, you know, installed their caste system, and it's still being in place. You know, the people in power, like, if we're going to talk about Mexico, the people in power are primarily light-skinned, which has been something that has been from the colonial times to, you know, to the independence, to the Mexican Revolution. That has always been the case because darker people, you know, always get the, you know, the short end of the stick because of that reason. So mm -hmm. it's just absurd to see that these types of things are still happening, you know? And I'm glad that like we're moving forward and people are becoming conscious, a lot more conscious. And like, you know, I guess like just realizing what they, could, they say, what they consume, what they like talk about. So, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like one thing that, isn't talked about a lot is how much people of color and 
you know, in regards to the Latinx and Latino Latina community and the Hispanic community, in regards to them, how much they pandered towards whiteness as much as they can, and how long they can pull this this whiteness out and how far up the social economic socio-political economic ladder they can climb as long as it pertains to how how far up and how white they can be and that's something that is so infuriating to me um because obviously we should be standing in solidarity with all our black and brown community across the spectrum and across like all skin colors and especially in solidarity for you know people with darker skin and because historically people with darker skin across the whole world have been um discriminated against and you know that i've met so many like white latinos and white mexicans who see themselves as white they see themselves as white people in a american society and it's just like you know i think it, it highlights how detrimental the true american like race so like race uh complex works over the entirety of america and it's like it's so it's so deeply rooted in these people it's so deeply rooted in all of us that we're going to ignore the issues that that are a part of our actual community and do as much as we can to pander towards whiteness so that we can succeed as opposed to that so we can liberate ourselves from a system that forces us to have to act like that like that's how deeply implemented it is into families into family structures into generational structures into the way that we interact with one another like it's oh it's there it's there and it's present <laughs> yeah it is so present you're so right so what would you say is from your perspective the most commonly held misconception about people of your culture hmm i mean there are so many to choose from you know there are just, we're branded as like drug dealers rapists criminals thugs um you know I don't know, stealers of jobs, whatever that means. Um, all of those are misconceptions. It's like, why are you going to brand us that way? You know, why are you giving us that? And it's obvious it's the color of our skin because they value whiteness over everything. You know, that's the way the society's built. That's the way the systems are built. And so whenever anybody shows any like darkness of course like that those are going to be the misconceptions that get brought up you know because people are afraid people are like they have this idea that has been deeply set you know it's like a seed was set in their head and like it sprouted into like this evil tree basically so yeah um for me i think a big one i want to say like this idea that we have to be hard hard workers you know there's this idea of the machismo being someone who doesn't stop working who doesn't stop working for their family who doesn't stop working you know for their honor as a, as a man and things like that and you know like why do we put so much value on work as if our work is equitable to some kind of value like like as if our lives only hold value if we're working for something if we're working for someone else and like that kind of has colonial roots in it too so i i think a big misconception is that all of us like have to be hard workers you don't have to be a hard worker to find value in your life you know you don't have to you know like you, you, yeah you don't have to you don't have to amount to to some kind of standard that other people have for you and so yeah yeah, I remember reading this tweet, and I think it was like, I wish I had the confidence of a mediocre white guy. Yeah, yeah, no, because... <laughs> <laughs> Another misconception that comes to mind is the narrative of, like, the angry Latina. Like, why do I have to be angry all the time? Or why am I fetishized all the time? Like, I feel like in media, the person who has been represented isn't really me like mm, like yeah. even in novellas like most of the female protagonists 
are a certain shade, are a certain size, and I don't know. I just wish we had more representation of different types of Latinas on TV and on media. Yeah, it's the it's the, like the exoticization of Latinas, you know? They're exoticized. They're seen as like how Joey said too, how they're described as fiery. They're spicy, you know? These terms are used for Latinas as like, oh, you know, that's how they are. So like, watch out, you know, you're not gonna be able to handle her and all this type of stuff. You know, it's like, what, what why? Where does this come from? <laughs> yeah, that's one of the biggest misconceptions too. It's like that Latinas are always gonna snap back. They're like toxicas, you know? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, maybe I am a little bit toxica, but that's okay. So, have you guys ever felt excluded based on your gender culture? Um, I haven't. I haven't been excluded based on my gender culture. I, you know, present masculinely. I have masculine features. And so people value masculine features over feminine features. And so I haven't been excluded because of that. And here in Southern California, you know, there's a lot of Latinx people specifically Mexicans, and that's the dominant culture here. So I, I haven't been excluded in that aspect either. And me, I felt like I was not only excluded, but I was invisible. Um, and I wasn't necessarily excluded on a to- in a topical sense. You know, I still was male presenting in a lot of situations and I still had that privilege follow me, you know, for a while until I was, you know, presenting as someone who was very obviously queer and very obviously, um, you know, not male or female. Um, and I just, yeah, I feel like I've always... I've always wanted to be a part of the girls club, but couldn't be a part of the girls club because I was a boy. And now that I'm not a boy or a girl and I've grown up into this idea of, you know, outerness, um, it's like my gender will always exclude me because my gender isn't real. Like I don't have a real gender. Like gender isn't real to someone like me. Like it's, it's quite literally a concept, a construct, a social one where we, you know, perceive each other and put these ideas of each other based off what we see. Um, But to me, like gender, I I don't lie in between man and woman. I don't lie as a third gender, one, two, three, you know, it's this idea that gender isn't real. And so that's why I feel like I, I will always be excluded for that because people see within boy and girl. And you, and you try to tell them that there's not just that and they can't see beyond that. And so that's why I do feel excluded. I'm sorry you feel excluded, Joey, and I'm sure you can relate to what I'm about to say, but um, when you're in a small community such as like the jazz community or the music community and you see that there isn't many people like you in these institutions or in these groups, you start to feel like you don't belong. And it's so rare to find like some solidarity sometimes, but one moment of solidarity that I can remember, Joey, was when we were all in your um, garage after rehearsal and we were looking around and we were like, yeah, we're all Hispanic. And we let that sink in and hell yeah, we were all Hispanic there. We were all living our dream. Yeah, I remember that. That was such a beautiful moment. It was it's kind of insane because I think some of the only times I would have ever been able to sit in a room full of just like Latino Hispanic musicians would be if I joined like a Latino Hispanic music club and all of us like and all of us kind of just found each other in our little niches in this big like fog and swarm of like white musicians and we found each other and not necessarily just because we were all Latino but because we stuck out to one another as like real individuals and you know you you always struck me with your uniqueness and you know your talent and your artistry and not only that but that's kept us together and on and then we suddenly found this collective of Latinx artists and it was just so beautiful. It's such a great, it's, it was such a great unifying moment. And I, I think that's something that like I value so much that even though, even though like it kind of did come out of college, college couldn't have brought me that. You know what I mean? We met each other at the college, but there was never a time where I was going to feel that kind of, you know, that, that feeling. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. I know what you mean. And as for me, when I think of exclusion, the first thing that comes to mind that I think maybe I have had to think about more than my male counterparts is when I get to that age where I do want to have a family, does that mean that I have to stop my career? Because traditionally, it it's the woman who stays home with the kid and yeah. the husband provides for the family. And not only that, but like I have to worry about how I'm going to get safely to my car after a late show. And I have to worry about like gender inequalities. Like I remember when I told my mom that I wanted to be a music major, she was like, are you sure? Like, I feel like only men can succeed in the music industry. And of course, my mom has changed very much since then. <laughs> I feel like as a 17 year old, that was very discouraging to hear. And now I've just come to realize that if I don't see my my dream available to me, I'm just going to create the position for myself. And I'm going to yes, create Yes, absolutely. So, now that the heavy questions are out of the way, I want to ask you guys, on a lighter note, what are some of your favorite things about Latinx culture, such as food, celebrities, or media? Hmm. Okay, okay. I mean, I guess looking back at it, like I used to like novellas a lot, you know, they're so dramatic, you know, it's good entertainment, but you start, you know, critically analyzing them and then you start breaking them down and you're like, oh, this is kind of really bad, you know, <laughs> the way like women are depicted, the way men are depicted and all this stuff, you know, that was one thing I used to think that was so like good about Latinx culture, but I guess in terms of like something I think is really good, I would say... Pozole. Pozole is so amazing. Like it's such a, even if it's the hottest day ever and like my mom makes it on the hottest day ever, you will sit, you will see me sitting at the table eating endlessly, you know? So that's one of my favorite things about like, I guess Latinx culture for sure. Just all the foods. <laughs> Speaking of novelas, Ellen, did you ever watch Rosa Guadalupe? Yes, yes, after school, and then, like, the reruns at night and all this stuff, hearing the music, oh, my God, hearing the music from my room, from the living room sometimes, I'll just be like, oh, my God, there they go, there they go. <laughs> yes, right before that white rose comes. <laughs> but, I mean, some of the episodes are really cringy, but I feel like I learned a lot of street smarts from it. Like, if someone offers me a weird drug at a party, I probably shouldn't take it, you know? Ooh, I think one thing or something about I really appreciate about Latinx culture is the music. Um, I just think it's, it's really interesting because despite how hard it is for uh, men uh, to be able to express themselves and talk about their emotions and talk about their feelings and stuff like that with, you know, machismo so present in our culture, all of this music is about their emotions and it's like it's it's drenched in poetry and it's like drenched in beautiful harmony and like beautiful chord progressions um and it's like i think music is some of the only things that helped a lot of men and you know women of course a lot of people to escape you know uh this idea of maybe machismo, maybe just like normal mundane life, but being able to um, appreciate something beautiful and something so everyday like music, I think that's that's one of my favorite things about Latinx culture is that the music was always, was always going to be beautiful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced our drunk uncles crying at Vicente Fernandez at like 2 a.m., you know? Yes, exactly. And honestly, Hispanic artists really influence me as an artist because they're so emotional and their word painting is incredible. When I, my mom put me on to like Vicente Fernandez, Jose Jose, and Juan Gabriel, I would like sit down and really just read their lyrics and be stunned by them because they were so deep and emotional. And it's, it, it showed like the Mexican narrative, the male Mex Mexican narrative in a way that was never, in a way that it was never shown before. And I really appreciate Hispanic music for that. Yeah, and it's it's so romantic and it's so, yeah, yeah. Yes, and I didn't include um, Luis Miguel, but he's so romantic and beautiful, I love him. Um, 
So now that we're wrapping up, is there anything you would like others to know that we have not included here about you or your culture? Mm, what can I include? Oh, well, I guess I, I really didn't say what my career was at the beginning, but I work as a public art associate for the Arts Council for Long Beach. So, you know, you could, you know, reach out to us if you have any public art ideas, you know, want to put up a mural, you have an organization, a nonprofit that wants to do something in the city, you know, you could always reach out to us. Uh, we're supporting artists all year round with our micro grants, you know, with COVID, we gave out, we gave out over $500,000 worth of grants for artists, you know? So I just want people to be aware that there is support for artistry in Long Beach and it's very strong and it will always be there and that we, we want to be there for all artists, you know? That we want to know that you will always be supported. <laughs> and I wanted to kind of do a similar thing. I totally <laughs> forgot to talk about what I do. <laughs> but um, I'm a Long Beach based jazz and hip hop artist and I, I gig and I play music out in LA. I play in OC. I play in Long Beach. I play anywhere where people will get me. But one of my biggest emphasis is um, as an artist specifically under the name Joey Naz. I um, especially want to be somebody who harbors, you know, my performances to be safe spaces for queer people and especially for queer people of color. It's um, so important for me that um, queer people feel like they have places where they can be where it's, where it's, you know, it's about them and it's for them. And so I've always been, I've always been an artist to stand behind that. So that's what I do. And, <laughs> and I've been, I've been an artist out here in Long Beach for two years and three years incoming. So barely starting and trugging along. <laughs> yes. And they did not mention this, but they have music out on Spotify. So go look up Joy Nas. I recommend starting off with their song, Mess. I'm obsessed with them. Then if you are also obsessed with them, I would suggest Angel Baby because it is incredible, just like they are. Oh my goodness. <laughs> before, before, before Aziza wraps up, I also want to do the same thing and say that Aziza Gomez is actually one of the band members of a band called The Modes. And they are also on Spotify. You can listen to them and their first single, Crash In. They have another single coming out speculatively soon. And they are on a fire track right now and nothing is gonna stop them. And go support, go support, yes. Oh, thanks, Joe. You didn't have to say all that, but thank you. So this about wraps up this week's episode of Beach Weekly. Thank you to all of our listeners for sitting through this episode with us. I wish you all a great day. Thank you.